Hello and welcome to the Cooper Smith Career Consulting Study Guide for Human Growth and Development. In this video we are going to review the course, a very interesting course that deals with the development both biological and psychological of the human being from birth all the way through death. Uh, we are going to discuss the various aspects of these the materials that's in the book. Just kind of give you a brief overview of what's covered in the materials. Uh, we're going to follow the PowerPoint that you should have access to. The first chapters are going to be just general areas of human growth and development and study. And then we are going to get into chronological studies, starting with birth and all the way through death. Our first unit is the theory and research in human development. This covers a general synopsis of the tools by which people can study human growth and development. Our first issue is the question of, okay, is it really appropriate to have one course or one study deal with human growth and development? Because there are many people that believe or feel that Really, children and adults live in distinct contexts, which means that children and adults really cannot be necessarily judged by the same patterns of development. Nevertheless, we're going to be ambitious, and we are going to uh, try to, in one study, give you kind of an overview, a little bit of a survey of human growth and development in both the childhood context and the adulthood context. In general, looking at contexts, looking at specifically the areas that you want to study, is critical with respect to any area, any study. And so as we go through this course, realize that the study of one aspect of a person's behavior may be very different than the study of a different aspect of the person's behavior. But let's go through some basic principles, and our first basic principle that I want to discuss is nature versus nurture. Nature versus nurture is kind of a controversy, but the answer, of course, as with many controversies, lies somewhere in between the two polar ideas. The idea of nature versus nature, nurture is what is the most important thing in the development of a human being. Now this could be the physical development and also the psychological development. Nature means the genes that we get, what we're born with, our DNA. You know, sometimes people who have smart parents are smart themselves. People who have tall parents are tall themselves. And those people who have uh, even parents who are uh, good athletes or good computer technicians or in good shape or whatever it is very often have children that are the same. Now that could partially be I guess because they grow up in the environment where they're used to seeing that but that also could be based on hereditary information that also could be based on the DNA. People that are born to parents with good DNA that makes them tall and strong and smart and talented uh, very often have the same predispositions to attain those goals as well. <clears throat> so some children learn language easily and rapidly because they're genetically predisposed to do so. Not necessarily, even though you may have two children who have the exact same t training and the exact same teaching and the exact same level of attention, they may be s given to different levels of learning speed and different levels of learning effectiveness simply based on the fact that they have different genes and they have different genetic structure. The other possibility, the other way of looking at it, is nurture. Nurture are the forces of the physical and social world that influence the makeup, the psychological and physical makeup of the human being. So for example, a person who's a child who spends the first 20 months in an orphanage may have certain behavioral models instilled and then when the person moves into a foster home or something to that effect the person may grow a little bit different. I mean the idea here is that somebody may be for example predisposed to be tall and strong but if the person doesn't eat properly and doesn't get you know enough protein and doesn't eat enough the person might end up being strong, short and weak even though the person was born with the potential for example to be you know six foot three and, and, and in great shape and be a bodybuilder but if the person didn't have any protein or you know, just didn't eat properly or was fed candy and, and no real meals for the first uh, 10 years of his life, then the person may not grow to be that. I mean, and nurture also, of course, has to do with the psychological makeup of the environment. You have people who grow up in an atmosphere that's abusive or in an atmosphere that is uh, where people are always saying negative things, the person may have a different personality. Even though the person may be 
genetically disposed to uh, being a nice person if the person grows up in a very hostile and mean environment that might not pan out. So there's this idea of nature and nurture. Now of course both of them do have some role. I think everybody, nobody thinks that uh, a person's personality and growth is 100% nature or 100% nurture. There's definitely a factor. I mean, they've had experiments where they've taken uh, twins who were separated at birth, identical twins who were separated at birth, and one was raised in one part of the world and the other in a different part of the world under totally, totally different circumstances, and they found that there were some amazing similarities between the two even though they were in totally totally in different environments that of course lends credence to the nature idea where you're look at your people turn out how they're predisposed to turn out on the other hand clearly you have circumstances where children who will grow up in homes that are broken or abusive or whatever it is tend to have psychological problems uh, regardless of their nature so you have nature and nurture are certainly both elements in terms of the development of a human being And the study of human growth and development can be done in many different ways. Here are two possibilities, behaviorism and social learning theory. Behaviorism is a way by which society and human growth and development in general, the study of it, is developed by observing people's behavior. Of course, we all do behaviorism. You know, if you're when you're a kid and you ask your mother for, uh, you know, for for a candy or something, you uh, look to see how your mother's face is going to react. Does your mother's face frown or does your mother's face smile? And based on that, you can you know develop your own little theory about how your mother's going to react. Uh, you know, you get in trouble at school, you kind of test the waters a little bit and see if are your parents upset, or are they not so upset? And you know, based on that, you behave appropriately. Well, scientists do the same thing. They develop they develop observe events like stimuli something that stimulates a response and the response itself and traditional behaviors use use classical and operant conditioning to mold children's behavior one way of training somebody whether they be children or adults is to use conditioning conditioning is the way in which uh, a person is trained to expect certain responses to certain to certain stimuli uh, we sometimes, if, if our child says thank you after being given something, we give them another candy or smile at them or say good boy or good girl, whereas if they just grab and walk away, we say that's not good, or we take the candy away or something. That, of course, is an example of operant conditioning. You're conditioning yourself, your, ch your child, to say thank you by associating positive behavior with this with a certain type of so, positive results with a certain type of behavior and negative results with other types of behaviors we use that in adults we use that on children we use that in ourselves we use that with everybody because that is uh, certainly something that that works with people and so behaviorism is the study of human growth and development by observing behavior and observing reactions to certain types of behavior then there's social learning theory. Now social learning theory is, again, it's not a contradiction with behaviorism necessarily, but social learning theory is studying behavior and studying development by the uh, by studying the underlying theory behind it cognition for example something if you study the scientific uh, rules behind why a person would react in a certain way so behaviorism and social learning theory come at the same goal trying to figure out why people develop and behave as they do looking at it from really different ways looking at it one from behaviorism is more of an experimental way of looking at it whereas social learning theory is more about it's trying to figure out the underlying reason as to why you know why does your child smile when you say good boy or, or, or something to that effect so of course, there are good parts of studying human behavior and development in this way, and then there are negatives of studying human developer development and behavior in these ways. Behaviorism and social learning theory have, of course, been helpful, and they consist of procedures that combine conditioning and to eliminate undesirable behaviors. I think we all realize, just from our own personal experiences, that operant conditioning, uh, studying things in terms of why they happen, and studying people's behavior to try to formulate predictions of what's going to happen in the future based on similar behavior are all very important and they could all do they all have their purpose and they all have their uh they all have their their places and they've been used to cure or prevent or mitigate 
problems, language delays, aggression, fears in virtual in both children and adults. Now, of course, the problem with just studying behaviors on a theoretical level and studying is trying to learn and predict people's behaviors is that these don't give enough credence to the individual's choice. I mean, think about it. If you're going to, you know, think of the logic behind somebody's reaction, and you're going to test their reaction, and you're going to say, oh, well, you know, uh, one child reacts in a certain way when you take away the toy. Another child's probably going to react the same way if you take away the toy, or, you know, something to that effect. In other words, if you try to apply these theories to everybody, you're kind of discounting personal choice. You're discounting people's contributions to their own development. So you might be able to do an experiment of 10 children and say, well, uh, if we give them extra recess, they're going to learn better, uh, you know, in the morning or whatever it is. And you can you can come up with this theory. That's not necessarily going to apply to 100% of children. It's not going to. Uh, the same rules don't apply to everybody because everybody has personal choice and everybody has their own personal, uh, you know, their personality and their biases and their, you know, just their nature that comes that comes. With just that that's that's individual to the person so you can't predict with 100% certainty what's going to happen even with these behaviorism, behaviorism studies social learning theories that's not to say they're not good it's not to say we shouldn't use them it's just to say that we have to realize that unlike math uh, where you know 2 plus 2 is always going to equal 4 no matter who the you know no matter who the student is you're not going to be 100% effective in predicting somebody's behavior when it even even if you do a good job in studying the reason behind that behavior and predicting uh, that behavior among other people Okay, now let's move on to uh, some other things regarding development. First of all, we've got this Piaget's stages of cognitive development. When do people actually develop as human beings? The first is the sensory motor stage, between when the child is under two years old, essentially when the child is a baby. During this time, the child uses... We, in this, in this slide, they're called, the child is called Sydney, but again, it could be any child, uses senses to explore the world, taste touch, sight, smell. That's how a baby really explores the world, explores the world by grabbing something, tasting it. And babies do that a lot. That's why you have to be very careful not to give a baby something small enough that they could swallow because babies will tend to put things in their mouths. That's the way they explore things. They only have five senses, sight, smell, touch, hear, and taste. And so they're going to use them. <laughs> and they're going to use sight, obviously. They're going to use hearing. They're going to use touching something, feeling it. They're going to use smelling it. And of course, they're going to try to taste it as well. Then you have the pre-operational stage, the small child stage from two to seven years old. Children use symbolic, but not necessarily logical thinking to solve problems. Children just don't think too deeply about things. They, they do something because they, it's worked last time or because they think it ought to work rather than actually doing too much uh, analysis. Then you've got the middle child stage, 7 to 11 years, thinking logically about concrete objects. So, for example, knowing that a quantity of Play-Doh remains the same whether it's a ball or a square. A middle-aged child, a 7 to 11 year old child, can figure something like that out, even though it may not be readily apparent right away by this sort of thinking. And then, as the child grows older, the child grows into the formal operational stage, where they can actually think pretty much like adults. You can start with a hypothesis, an experiment. That's really the scientific method, where you start with a hypothesis, which is an educated guess, and then you figure out a way to experiment and test your hypothesis and see if it's accurate. Well, a child may do some do it slightly differently, but an older child will do or will do will use the process that's pretty similar to what we would use as an adult. Okay, so. Now, uh, just a couple of more things regarding this chapter. Research methods in general. Research methods are, this is a whole other course called research methods, and there's a little bit of research methods in all the psychology courses that we offer, because research methods are just kind of how the methods by which uh, psychology can be researched, of course. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on, on it in this course, but just a couple of notes that are important. First of all, observations in order to develop hypotheses and test hypotheses have to be made. Those can be naturalistic, just observed people in their normal state, or they could be under structured observation. You know, if you want to see 
how people respond to pain. You can sit around and wait until they experience pain on their own, and or you know, if, you, if you're a nurse or a doctor, you can keep uh, a record of all the people that come in with pain and see how they react to certain uh, certain treatments. Or you can sh do a structured observation where you get volunteers to come in and to get uh, you know pricked or pinched or something and see how they react to certain treatments to pain. You also have self-report situation where you can ask people to give you the information rather than you having to observe it. You can have a clinical interview where you sit somebody down and ask them various aspects of their lives or what treatments have worked in various circumstances. Or you could have a structured interview where you have the same script and you're asking each person the same thing. Different ways have different advantages in different circumstances. If you want to be have a perfect control group, if you want to have a perfect the same set of variables on each aspect of the experiment, a structured interview might be better. If you want to get have people be more at ease and more likely to divulge information, maybe a clinical interview would be better. And then you have the clinical method, or the case study method, same idea, essentially is where if you want to test something, you have somebody go through the treatment start to finish, or many people go through a treatment start to finish, and give you an opportunity to look at the sum total of how it works. Experiments in general, and this applies to all science, not just human growth and development, and even not just psychology, first thing, you, what you really need to do is you need to develop an experiment in order to test hypothesis. If, I'm, if, if my hypothesis is, for example, that uh, if I eat a good breakfast, then I'm not going to be hungry until uh, until one o'clock until one o'clock in the afternoon, or something to that effect. That's my hypothesis. My I, my educated guess is that if I eat a good breakfast, I'm not going to be hungry for four hours, and I'm not going to be hungry until one o'clock. So, what you need to do is you need to establish a dependent variable and an independent variable. The independent variable is the thing that you're testing. The, so, for example, an independent variable in my case would be eating breakfast or not eating breakfast. So if I want to test this on, generals, on, on the general population, so I might get, you know, 100 people together, and the independent variable, the thing that I'm testing, is whether they eat, is that they eat breakfast or not. The dependent variable, the thing that I'm assuming will be influenced by the independent variable, is the hunger until one o'clock. And in order to test that, what I should try to do is I should use random assignments. For example, if I get a hundred people in a room that are willing to do my experiment, I'll feed 50 of them a good breakfast, and 50 of them will not feed them a good breakfast. And 50 of them will give them uh, an egg sandwich with, with coffee and, and cereal, and the other 50 I'll give, uh, I don't know, a donut or something. So. So, and I would do it randomly. Obviously, I, I want to make sure that to to, to pick the 50-50 as randomly as possible, because I don't want to, for example, pick the 50 young people and put them in one group, and 50 old people and put them in the other, because then maybe the fact that they're not hungry it just has to do with the fact that younger people happen to get hungry more. You want to try to make the assignments to the groups as randomly as possible. And then we've got then we test the dependent variable, which is which is the how hungry they get in the late morning, early afternoon, by changing up the independent variable, giving 50 of them yes and 50 of them no. The ones that got the group are actually it's not on the slide, but they're called the the one that got the ones that got the breakfast is called the experimental group. They're being tested on, and the other group, the one that didn't, is called the control group. And then you measure the results and see, uh, you know, 25% of these people are hungry, whereas 60% of these people were hungry. You see there is a measurable difference. On the other hand, maybe, uh, you know, maybe you don't see a measurable difference. Maybe in one group out of 50 people, the people that got the good breakfast, uh, you know, 23 of them were hungry, and of the people who got donuts for breakfast, maybe 22 of them are hungry. And so maybe I would I would say, listen, I've done the experiment, but there's not a measurable difference. There's not a big enough difference for me to make any conclusions. And that's really the hallmark of a good experiment. Chapter 2, or Unit 2, is Developmental Foundations. We're going to go through some general, almost fundamental, 
ideas that apply to the human being mostly before birth and around the time of birth that are relevant to the human's development. First of all, we got the genetic code in the nature versus nurture debate. The nature element is based on the person's DNA. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Essentially, it is the genetic material that is in the chromosomes that are in the nucleus of each and, our, each and every one of our cells. We've got you know, billions, trillions, quadrillions of cells throughout our body. And each one of them has these chromosomes. Each one, each human being one has uh, 46 different chromosomes, and the chromosomes are made of DNA. And the DNA are the things that allow the expressions of the various traits in your body. Your DNA in your eyes is adapted to, well, the same DNA, but the part, the DNA it gives instructions for the cells in your eyes to facilitate seeing, etc. So, We've got uh, so the, a gene is a segment of DNA along the length of a chromosome. A gene is something that indicates some certain characteristic. A person, for example, might have a gene for brown eyes, or a gene for blonde hair, or a gene to be tall, or a gene to be smart, or many genes that could be that in combination could affect all of these different things. And these differences, even very slight differences, can make very big differences in the organism itself. So for example, humans and chimpanzees have between 98 and 99 percent similar between chimpanzees and human beings. Now, does that mean that we're 98 percent similar to a chimpanzee? Well, I mean, we're in terms of our genetic makeup, yes, but that one percent is a big difference. That one percent is enough to make a difference between a human being and a, uh, and a chimpanzee. It doesn't say on the slide, but probably the difference, the difference between our DNA and the DNA of a fruit fly is probably 90 percent similar or 92 percent similar, because life is, life in general is more similar than it is different uh, when it comes to all the life on earth so uh, but that difference that that small 1% 5% 10% difference between our dna and the dna of a of a, of a potted plant or uh, you know an apple tree or or a fruit fly is enough to make obviously a huge difference because that difference tells the fruit fly to grow you know grow very small wings and and whatever and tells us to grow brains and arms etc cetera, etc cetera. so the genetic code and so you can imagine the difference between the various human beings you know as siblings they might have slightly different characteristics but their DNA is probably, you know, 99.9% .9 similar to each other, or even more. Genetic counseling is the idea of a communication process trying to assess the possibility of giving birth to a uh, to, to to a baby with a hereditary problem or hereditary disorder. Uh, now, genetic counseling. I mean, if you're listening to this, you very well might be familiar with the organization called Darya Sharm. And what they do, in many similar organizations, is they try to make sure that, that two people um, are not carriers for the same genetic illness. You know, diseases like uh, Tay-Sachs and familial dysautonomia and a few other diseases uh, can, can manifest themselves in children if two parents that are both carriers for the disease get married. And so what they try to do as part of genetic counseling is to try to make parents aware of any potential risks they have for having children that have severe uh, genetic disorders. Genetic counseling can also be recommended when there's some sort of a risk factor. There's known genetic problems, women's over 35 years old, which can lead to, lead to birth defects and, and, and DNA problems. Uh, again, the reason for that is because the the cells are not as strong and the DNA can fall apart and mutate more easily when the woman is older than when the woman is younger. A uh, couple suffering from fertility, again, these are all w situations in which it may make sense to get some genetic counseling. There are other than during this genetic counseling, there are ways to maximize the chance of having a healthy baby. A physical exam, consider the genetic makeup and go for genetic counseling, like in the case of Darya Sharm. Uh, reduce, or, reduce or eliminate toxins. You know, have the mother take vitamins and, and not, not, uh, not eat and drink things that are going you know, to hurt and that are going to cause problems, potentially. And take, take prenatal vitamins and mineral supplements. Another thing, before we even get to the birth, another thing that's going to affect the development of a human being is the society that he or she lives in. Certainly, 
there's one it's one thing to have a certain genetic makeup it's another thing to look at the person's home it's in, but the where the person the media influence the influence from outside the person's home is certainly going to have a major factor on the person's development there on the fundamental level there are collectivist systems and their individualistic systems. Uh, collect collectivist systems are systems that put more emphasis on the benefit or on the health of society in general, not necessarily on each individual. In collectivist societies, people define themselves as part of a group and stress group goals rather than individual groups. Uh, individual groups. Individual, excuse me, individual goals. Whereas individual societies or where people are mainly concerned about their own needs uh, rather than individuals. Just to give you an example, the United States is mainly individualistic. There's certainly a lot of emphasis in our society on personal happiness and personal goals rather than the goals of the entire group. You know, other countries like Japan, for example, are much more collectivist, where people are worried much more about the overall health of the country than maybe Americans are. Now, of course, there's not necessarily a proper or improper way to run a society i mean and and some combination is good is good in in different ways certainly individualism tends to uh, promote development and entrepreneurialism where people start their own businesses and and try to you know and, and the, the fact that they want to to personally enrich themselves leads them to try to make advancements on the other hand uh, individualist societies can have people be selfish and that could that could hurt people who aren't lucky enough to do well uh, so there, there are obviously advantages and disadvantages in both elements, and the ideal is to have some sort of a good combination of collectivism and individualism uh, in, different, in different aspects. And again, the bigger the society and the more complex a society, individualism starts to become almost necessary. I mean, if you have a society of 310, 320 million people like the United States, uh, you can't have everybody running everything. You know, like on a kibbutz in Israel, for example, that's a very, very collectivist society where people don't worry so much about themselves individually, but they worry much more about the good in general. People are given jobs. You know, people are given jobs that may be demeaning and may not, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're cleaning out the kitchen even though they're, uh, you know, they're a scientist might be given the job to clean out the kitchen, but he does it because it's best for the collective. It's best for the group that he's a part of, and that's, you know, a, a group decides this person is best doing this in this particular time, at this particular day, and the person does it without worrying so much about themselves. And self-reliance and privacy have made the U.S. government hesitant to become inv involved in family mem matters in general, which again leads toward much more of an individualistic society in our case. The study of how people react to their society, and it, it can be hered hereditary or heritability, or and this is really kind of a study that measures the extent to which individuals in complex societies, with complex traits, um, are to, to determine how much of that is due to genetic factors and how much of that how much of that is due to family and how much of that is due to society. In other words, they can do these studies and say, well, we have an individualistic society. Uh, you know that encourages self promotion and self acting and you have somebody who's uh, you know to what extent does that mean that the person's going to be selfish or look out for their own interests or uh, can a, does a person's nature overcome that if the person's nature is to be very cooperative is that person going to be cooperative even in a society that is very individualistic that's really the sort of thing that that these studies would try to measure and finally, before we get to the section of the course that deals with human development and deals with the development of the person from birth all the way through death, let's look at some of the factors that affect the person's situation when he or she is born. First of all, during pregnancy, there are very important things that a mother has to be worried about, namely nutrition. During the prenatal period, which means before birth, children grow more rapidly than any other time. It doesn't seem like it. When the baby comes out, the baby only may, may only be seven or eight pounds, but or even less. But growing from nothing, <laughs> it's, it's a big percentage. You know, a child might grow from, uh, you know, from 50 pounds to 100 pounds, but that may take five years. 
you know, whereas going from zero to seven pounds by a percentage basis is only you what know, happens in nine months. That's a much faster rate of growth in terms of percentage than any other time. So the child, of course, ha depends totally on the mother for for nutrition, and therefore. Mothers not always, but very often gain weight during pregnancy because the mother is. It's not only the weight of the baby, obviously, and the weight of the, uh, the fluids that are and the, the placenta and all that, but also you're talking about the mother needing to eat in order to uh, to get the baby the nutrients that are necessary. Certainly, mothers have cravings and and uh, have desires to you know to eat certain things, and a lot of that is part of the nature of pregnancy. Whereas the baby needs certain nutrients, and because of that, the mother feels the need to eat those things. And emotional distress is not so good for for pregnancy. So uh, when women experience severe emotional distress, babies are at risk for a variety of difficulties. When a baby is born, the first thing, obviously, they in the hospital they check for uh, various illnesses, they check for various problems. One of the scales they use at the very beginning of life, really, just you know, in the first few minutes, literally of life, uh, they look at the Apgar scale. The Apgar scale is not 100% perfect, but it's a pretty good way to make an initial assessment in you know literally the first five five ten minutes of life whether the baby's in good shape or whether the baby needs urgent care and the APGAR scale assesses the newborn's physical condition very quickly each one of these is given a rating of zero one or two zero for not good two for good and one for okay appearance color the better the you know good color uh, would be a two a little grayish would be a would be a one and zero would be very grayish or not good at all. Heart rate, obviously a good heart rate would be a two, not good not good heart rate would be a zero. Reflex irritability, does the baby show reflexes as they should? The muscle tone of the baby and the respiratory effort, how is the baby able to breathe easily? Uh, once they add up all these five scores, you give them you know a two for this, a one for this, a two for this, seven or more indicates the infant is doing well, a four to a six shows that the baby needs assistance uh, and but hopefully nothing too bad unfortunately a score of three or lower indicates that the infant is in serious danger and they'll very often take the baby straight to the NICU to the neonatal infant care uh, in <laughs> intensive care unit excuse me a baby in general will also be studied to see you know what it, does the, is the baby sleeping properly? And these things are measured, uh, or not sleeping properly, but but awake, awaking properly. The opposite, really, and will be measured in states of arousal. There's regular sleep, which is uh, which is the lowest state of arousal. The instant is at full rest, and breathing is regular and normal. Then you have irregular sleep, which the infant's limbs are are stirring, but the baby is still asleep. There's drowsiness quiet alertness and waking activity and crying. Again, these are just ways in which obviously the, all of them will happen at one point or another, but when the infant is being tested for vital signs, the state of arousal does have to be noted. Now we're going into the part of the course that starts with infancy and goes all the way up through, well, death. <laughs> So now we're going to start with infancy and toddlerhood, obviously the earliest part of the human development after pregnancy, of course. Now, it's a lot more important for a newborn child or even a young child to experience and use his or her senses even more so than an adult. A early extreme sensory deprivation can result in permanent brain damage and loss of functions. So for example, if uh, a baby it can't see for whatever reason. In this example, the example is cataracts. Uh, let's say, or if you know, let's say, just you, you held the wool over a baby's eyes for the first year of life, or something like that. So when you take it, took it off. I mean, I guess the baby would be able to see at that point, but the baby would not have the same level of functions. In general, it's important for babies to be able to explore their surroundings in early childhood to allow the brain to develop appropriately those functions. So that's one aspect of important brain development. Intermodal perception takes this one step further. Intermodal perception is the idea of experiencing senses from more than one mode, from more than one modality, which means more than one source. So for example, uh, you know, is how something tastes 
you know, when we eat something, it's not just taste that we're that you know that allows us to experience the food. Uh, it's the sight of the food. Certainly, if something looks good, it's more more likely to enjoy it. It's the smell of the food. Uh, maybe even sometimes the sound, you know, if it's crackling and, you know, it's uh, or some, something like that. If our Rice Krispies are crackling, maybe it makes us, it's, it feel, it sounds more fresh. Uh, you know, they say, actually, one of the reasons why airline, people think airline food doesn't taste good is that probably because it probably does taste fairly similar to the food when you're on the ground. But when you're that high, the aroma, because the air pressure is lower, because the humidity is lower, whatever it is, you just can't smell it as much. And because you can't smell your food as much when you're on an airplane, you don't think it's as good, even though it might be the exact same food that you're eating on the ground. Anyway, I just read that a few months ago at one point. It's an idea. So we make sense of, stre of, of running streams of light, sounds, touch, odor, taste, and everything. Uh, so this is something that we don't just rely on one sense. Very often we use multiple senses to establish something, and of course human beings do, excuse me, human beings, children do the same thing. Uh, children engage in make-believe play. This is not only normal, it's completely healthy. It's, it would not be healthy if no child ever, never, if, if, if a child never pretended anything and never, never engaged in make-believe play, that would actually be the thing that, uh, that wouldn't be healthy. Now, these things, the, all children do it, but how they do it and what they imagine, what they make-believe, of course, will be subject to cultural influences. In cultures where extended family households and siblings, sibling caregiving, caregiving are common, make believe is more frequent. If there are many, there are many. There's a much greater range of perceptions to draw from. Uh, these are, and siblings also, I guess, like to teach the babies to play and play with them. In some cultures, ob ol older siblings often teach, uh, less often teach deliberately, but still serve as influential role models of play. Uh, you know, a one-year-old or a two-year-old might see a seven, eight-year-old playing. The play is going to be different, but the fact the seven, eight-year-old is playing influences the baby's ability to make believe and ability to play. When adults participate, toddlers make believe is even more elaborate. They'll, uh, the, when parents play with their children, the children will go above and beyond. I mean, I see this with my own kids, that uh, the, the children will go above and beyond to make a more elaborate uh, make-believe scheme so that they, you know, to, to try to bring the parents into their little world. And that, of course, is very healthy, and that's one reason why playing with children is, uh, is a very good thing that parents can do. Emotions are something that all children have, no matter how old they are. And it may, they, it, although children do adapt and use emotions a little bit differently from adults, infants' emotional expressions are, are closely tied to their ability to interpret the emotional cues of others. Children, babies can sense the emotions of their parents. Are their parents upset? Uh, you know, they say one of the reasons why sometimes when you're when the baby's up in the middle of the night and you have to wake up and you're in, and you're sitting there with the baby, uh, I once heard from actually a psychologist that the best thing to do is to give up on sleep. Is to say, okay, I'm not going to sleep for the rest of the night. I'm just going to stay up with the baby. I'm going to do something else. Uh, because if you panic and you say, oh, the baby has to sleep. I have to sleep quick, 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 quick. Then the baby's going to sense that you're agitated and that's just going to make the baby more agitated and it's going to make the baby less likely to go to sleep. If you give up and you're calm, and you're not worried about going back to sleep, then the baby also won't be so worried, and then the baby will fall back asleep. <laughs> and again, not always, it's not going to work 100% of the time, but I've heard that this works. Uh, infants from five months on tend to perceive facial expressions as organized patterns. Is the parent upset? Is the, per is the parent smiling? Is the parent happy? Is the parent agitated? Even five-month-olds can pick up on these cues. And, and from even under a year, from eight to ten months, they can engage, babies can engage in social referencing, which means seeking emotional information, doing something to see how the parents react. You know, sometimes an eight-month-old, ten-month-old may do something that the child knows will make the, the parents smile. You know, if, if one time the, the child uh, giggles or makes a move with their, or makes a wave, you know, my kid used to wave sometimes and say hi or something like that, and then the parent smiles and the parent has a reaction, then the child gets to know, gets to repeat that because the, the, the child wants to see that reaction in the parents. The caregiver's voice 
even with with even in addition to a facial expression is more effective than the facial expression alone so even though babies can't understand english you know babies who are uh, you know five months old, six months old, seven months old, they don't understand English, they don't understand exactly what you're saying when you say go to sleep or you're a good girl or whatever it is, the baby's not going to understand what that means. But the this it can inc increase the experience of of the of the baby's senses. So talking to a baby, even if the baby isn't going to understand, actually there is some purpose. And let, making sure the baby sees you because the baby can pick up on your uh, cues, the baby can pick up on your expression, the baby can pick up on whatever nonverbal cues you're giving. You might not even notice it, but the baby might notice it. Toddlers in the middle of their second year, one and a half year olds, two year olds begin to appreciate others' emotional reactions from different that and that may that they may they may appreciate the fact that their parents may react to things differently than they do. Uh, this is an example over here that an 18-month-old was shown cauliflower and pretzels. Even though the baby wants the pretzels, she might offer the cauliflower to the mother if she, if in the past she has been conditioned to realize that the mother is going to like that more. Uh, you know, so the, the even though the when the baby is 10 months or 12 months or 14 months, if the baby takes the crayon and colors on the wall, the baby has no idea that the parent isn't going to appreciate it. The baby's having fun, so the, the baby probably assumes that the parent is having fun, too. And once the kid reaches 18 months, a little bit more than that, then all of a sudden they can start appreciating the difference between the way their parents are going to react to something and the way they, the way they react to something. They say that's the reason why any kind of a punishment for a child under the age of uh, 15 to 18 months is pointless. And the reason is because they're just not going to understand what they, they they're not capable of understanding that there's a difference between their emotion and someone else. A 12-month-old, a 13-month-old just doesn't understand that something that's fun for them could be bad, have other bad consequences. Once they reach 18 months, all of a sudden they can, uh, they can at least start understanding the distinction between their own emotions and other people's emotions. And so then uh, at least you know, some level of education actually does something in that respect. Uh, emotional self-regulation, and this is something that parents do and it's something that children do also, is a strategy that we use to adjust our emotional state so we can accomplish our goals. You know, parents, ob ch adults are obviously a lot, m lot more sophisticated at this, where they can manipulate and pretend that they like people when they really don't in order to get them to, you know, or in order to manipulate them into doing doing what they want. Children can also be manipulative. I mean, people use, say manipulative as a bad word. And it can be bad, but on the other hand, we all manipulate uh, things to, to one extent or another. I think we all manipulate people to, to some extent, even if, for example, we're not really happy, but we put on a smile to satisfy our spouse, that you know, to make our spouse feel good. I don't think anybody would think that's a bad thing, but, uh, but we do it. Just, you know, we, we mask our own emotions because we don't want to drag other people down with us or for whatever reason. This, of course, requires voluntary effort man effortful management of emotions. Again, it, it, you know, it may not seem like much when we smile even though we're in a bad mood to make other people feel happy, we, but we do it, uh, it, we may not think about it, but it's, you know, because we've done it so often, but uh, it is the sort of thing that requires conscious thought and conscious strategy, strategizing. Uh, the capacity of effortful controls improves gradually as a result of the development of the prefrontal cortex, which is a component to the brain, of course, and the assistance of our caregivers. And finally, we come to the idea of attachment security. Attachment security is the security that children get from being attached to their caregiver, to their parent, to, their, to, to an older sibling, somebody that they look to for emotional support. Early availability of a consistent um, a caregiver, quality, the characteristics of the infant itself; these are all things that is, that that affect the extent to which this the attachment security will take place and will be effective. Uh, family circumstances, you know, people that grow up in broken homes, like in this example, uh, Kate's mother uh, put her, put her in a childcare home and was working was working all the time, and and ignored her ignored her child or found that her child was ignoring her basically the idea is that a lack of emotional support it may not be it may not be something that the parents can control I mean it may just be be circumstances but a lack of emotional support and a lack of attention could cause a decrease in the security that the child feels with the parent and therefore the attention that the child gives to the parents and in this case Catherine should seek, seek social support from family and friends and of course try to get as concerned a caregiver as possible 
Now we move to that second stage of childhood, after the infant stage, really kind of the toddler or early childhood stage, two to six years. One thing that's very important, of course, for younger children, as well as babies, is nutrition. Preschoolers' appetites decline as opposed to babies because their growth has slowed. It may seem like they're growing more, but in fact they're growing less, again, as a percentage basis. A seven pound baby, you know, by the time, they're, by the, time the baby turns two, three years old, may weigh 20, 25, 30 pounds, something like that. Uh, and you're talking about a lot, that's a big, that's, that's growing three times, three times the size, the, the four times the size the baby was originally. Toddlers also grow, but not quite that fast. They don't grow, uh, you know, to three times their size over the course of the next two years. So preschoolers' wariness of, food, of new foods is adapted, is adaptive, which means that children who are trained to s try new foods are more likely to be a little bit less picky. Uh, if they stick to familiar foods, they're less likely to swallow dangerous substances, excuse me, and therefore children do tend to be picky about what they eat. And you may have noticed, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I know I have kids and nephews and all that who are very, very picky eaters. Uh, and but the children are weary for good reason. They're they're you know they're designed to be a little wary about eating things because uh, things can be dangerous. But repeated re repeated exposure to new foods will increase the chances that a preschooler will try it, even if she's a picky eater. If it's always on the table, for example, then eventually maybe they'll try it once in a while, even though children do tend to sometimes be picky eaters. Another thing that's important, just like for infants, is make believe. Make believe in symbolic mastery. Symbolic mastery is the idea that children try to become in control of their environment and have the ability to, you know, if they have toys, the children want to be in control of their little domain, of their little, uh, be master of their little uh, symbol, symbolic, symbolic domain. Children, uh, make believe is an excellent example of the development of representation in early childhood. Piaget, who we saw before in terms of the development cycles, believe that through pretending, young children practice and strengthen newly acquired representation schemes. In other words, they try to uh, have one item or one toy represent something else in their life. Uh, they may have a doll representing their parents or their siblings. They may have a doll representing themselves. They may have a little uh, house representing a doll house representing their own house. In early pretending, like in the first at the beginning, toddlers use only realistic objects. They may not be able to stretch their mind, like they may be able to use a, you know, a doll to symbolize a, a baby, but they won't necessarily be able to use maybe a stick figure to represent a baby. They won't really draw the connection to the same extent. So the earliest pretend acts usually imitate the adult's actions. They have trouble using an object that already has an obvious use as a symbol of another. They won't, for example, use a, uh, a utensil to represent a person, or a cardboard box to represent a house. A cardboard box look like, looks like a cardboard box. You get the child gets a little older, four, five, six years old. Maybe they will be able to transform in their minds the cardboard box into the house. But at the first stage, basically, the cardboard box will represent the cardboard box, and that's uh, that's pretty much it. And then, as the child moves along, people who study development of children like to look for three changes, three gradual changes, as the way in terms of the way the children uh, grow in this symbolic mastery, grow in this idea of of being able to be more mature in terms of symbolism. Number one, play detaches from the real life conditions associated with it. They can create, they can start to play with things that are not as realistic. Rather than just pretending a doll that looks like a baby is a baby, maybe they can look at a, you know, an action figure which looks less like a baby and pretend that's a baby. You may notice, I've noticed that in my own kids, as they, also as they get older, they're able to pretend an item is a different item even when it doesn't look like it even when uh, it, it has a, a different obvious use. The, the example I gave before, I think, is the best one I can think of right now. That is the cardboard box being a house. Even though at the beginning the baby just may look at a cardboard box and figure out that it's a box, but that's enough. Uh, but then, you know, you can convert that into a living, uh, something that can be lived in with a little bit of imagination.
The next stage is when play becomes less self-centered. Children, young children, will focus on their own wishes and their own emotions. As the child goes along, children can become participants, uh, making the doll feed itself, or having the car, you know, pretending the car is going somewhere, somewhere else, or pretending the characters in their little drama that they're playing out are, are behaving on their own. Uh, you know, the very, very young child may feed the baby, and the older child may pretend the baby is feeding itself. Increasingly, preschoolers realize that agents and recipients of pretend actions can be independent of themselves. They don't necessarily have to control 100% of everything. They can imagine that it's happening without their direct intervention. And then, as children move along, at this point you're getting into late toddler stage, the play can include more complex combination of schemes. Preschoolers combine themes with their peers, one person can be the child, the other person can be the adult, one person can drive and can pretend that they're driving the car, another person can pretend they're going to shop for groceries, whatever it is. And at this point, as children get older and towards that upper end of the toddler spectrum, they may be able to more appropriately combine the relationships of the various people in their play in terms of what they're doing. Now, of course, the children don't do all of this by themselves. Adult intervention is important and is necessary. For example, you have this concept of assisted discovery. Assisted discovery means guiding children through learning, tailoring their interventions to each child's zone of proximal development. Sounds complicated, but that just means making sure that they interfere or interject themselves into the child's play only where necessary to kind of stimulate it. You know, let the child play by itself, and then, and then, but then there's a doll in the corner, and maybe you go over and say, what's that doll doing? Or, you know, what's she doing? What's he doing? Uh, you know, is she hungry? Is he hungry? Something like that. Children also, of course, play with each other. That's peer collaboration. They don't only have interjections from their parents or from their caretakers. They also have interjections from their friends. AIDS-assisted discovery and the children of varying abilities work in groups, and they help each other. Children can play with each other and give each other cues. May not, maybe not intentionally, they may not be doing it intentionally to help each other, but uh, they may add parts to the story that they're playing with. You know, two, three-year-olds may be playing with, uh, with the dolls, and they may feed each other parts of the story. Oh, now this one's doing this, now this one's doing that. And that kind of helps each one of them uh, by giving them access to ideas that they may not have come up necessarily on their own. At this point, as the child is moving along in his or her development, you get to the stage of planning. Planning means not just doing something for instant gratification, not doing something, you know, grabbing the chocolate because the chocolate tastes good, or, uh, you know, moving the car because moving the car is fun, but planning a couple of steps ahead, doing things that, you know, may have consequences minutes or even hours into the future. So if planning means thinking out a sequence of acts ahead of time, and allocating attention accordingly to each goal. Of my plan is four stages. Number one, I'm going to bring the chair over to the bookcase. Number two, I'm going to get up on the chair. Number three, I'm going to reach up and I'm going to get the game. Number four, I'm going to put the game down on the floor. And number five, I'm going to open the game. And number six, I'm going to take out the pieces. And then number seven, finally, I'm going to play play with it. Well, that's a plan. You know, the two-year-old, my three-year-old might not fully be well. Uh, that's a simple enough plan that very often a three-year-old can figure out also. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, you very as children get up, they get their plans can get more and more complicated. You know, maybe they'll put something away with the intention of, of building it, of continuing the building the next day. You know, that's something that maybe a three-year-old wouldn't fully comprehend. You know, starting to put a puzzle together one day uh, so that you can come back, come back the next day and finish it, so that's something that may take a little bit older than, let's say, a three-year-old, you know, toward the end of adult childhood to be able to plan from one day to the next. So five-year-olds are certainly capable of generating a plan. For example, a five-year-old can decide in which of two locations to store a camera, so another one can take out the camera before arriving at the lion's cage. So for example, you know, if, if they're, well, I mean, this example, uh, the child puts it there knowing that somebody else will come and take it later on. You know, a two or three-year-old might not be able to think that far ahead, might not be able to understand that by me putting this here, some other child will come and be able to pick it up at that point 
and continue it, you know, kind of like a relay, uh, a, a, a later, a later younger childhood, like four or five, six year old, might be able to understand. When parents encouraging planning, this of course helps the children develop this skill as well. Now we get to early word learning. Now children usually start understanding words, maybe uh, you know, maybe even under a year sometimes. Children don't start usually talking until something like 18 months, 15, 18, 21 months, something like that. Uh, it could start with a very simple word like no or yes or mommy, and then of course it uh, it it goes, it becomes much more complex. Preschoolers figure out the meaning of new words by contrasting them with words that they already know. You know, if you learn yes, well, yes was the opposite of no. School may be the opposite of home. Sleep, well, I guess maybe the opposite of play. I mean, so, but preschools can also figure out many words by observing how they're used. If an adult says to about a car, this is a Citron one now. Citron one might not. Uh, the child probably doesn't understand that Citron is a synonym for yellow. Uh, but if the child sees that the adult is referring to the yellow car. Well, now the child might say, okay, you know, that's a car, or that's a yellow car. But then the children, then the child sees something else being called a citron, you know, a lemon, and says, that's citron also. And now the child figures out, well, you know, gee, it must not be a car, because that's not a car. But the things that, that were in common was that this was yellow and that was yellow, and then the child's able to understand that citron actually means something to do with yellow. A very important factor in raising any child is promoting self-esteem. Self-esteem means the judgments we made about we make about our own worth and the feelings associated with those judgments. How we evaluate ourselves affects everything, affects our experiences, our behavior, and our long-term psychological adjustments. People who feel good about themselves feel more confident, have the ability to take on new things, think that they can accomplish things. Children or people with low self-esteem obviously suffer in many ways. Even by the age of four, preschoolers can make self-judgments. They can learn about things school, friends, getting along with parents, treating others kindly. Children who have good experiences uh, feel more self-confidence. You know, children who are, you know, who are in a, in, a, in a situation where they're given negative reinforcement a lot may develop low self-esteem. Because preschoolers have difficulty distinguishing between their desired and actual competence, they may rate their ability as very high and underestimate the ability of to do something. They may think it looks easy to climb up on that chair and get that game down, but it may take a couple of trial and errors, so to speak, in order for them to figure out that maybe it's not as easy as they thought. Nevertheless, of course, it is important to promote high self-esteem for the reasons we discussed before. Uh, Parents who patiently encourage their children while offering information on how to succeed, you know, move the chair, this, take the doll and put it over here, take that piece of the puzzle, put it over there, but let the child try to figure things out as much as possible on their own while giving them helpful advice can promote self uh, can promote self-esteem by allowing the child to become confident by having successes. Parents who criticize their children's worth and get and basically you know criticize the child for for uh, for doing a bad job encourage the child to give up easily and to not uh, you know to not put their maximum effort in they can also adjust their child's expectations they can help scaffolding the child's attempts by giving them a little assistance where necessary and by pointing out effort and improvement you know even if the child didn't didn't succeed in something well you made a good try well you did certain things well and adjusting the child's expectations is also important because you don't want the child to give up after not being able to do a particularly difficult task. You want the child to, say, to think, oh well, you know, I tried and all I can do next is to try more. Uh, the next thing I want to quickly go through is the gender schema theory, schema theory, and that is the information processing approach that in which children identify with their gender and the members of their own gender. This explains how environmental pressures work together with innate things, with nature, to try to, uh, to, to develop a person's gender identity. You know, for example, a girl might 
learned that cooking is a girl's job and cars or trucks are for boys, that may be because of some element of nature, but it might also be because that's what they see. You know, they see other girls playing with dolls, and they see other boys playing with trucks, or their parents give them a doll and give their brother and give the brother a truck, something like that. So that's the sort of thing that contributes. Obviously, there are inherent differences between boys and girls also, but that contributes to gender identity. However, this can be taken a step further. In fact, children can associate anything they like with members of their gender. In this example, four-year-old four Johnny doesn't like fish, and if he's gender schematic, he can think, well, that must be because I'm a boy, and so girls like fish and boys don't like fish. Obviously, that's not necessarily true, but so, I mean, gender, um, looking at things from a gender schematic perspective has to be limited to some extent. Then there's general child rearing uh, philosophies, and there are many different types. Some, obviously, this, there's not necessarily a best way to raise a child, but some of these might be better than others in certain areas. Authoritative, which is telling the child what to do in a firm way, but not, you know, not in a in a mean or harsh way. Warm, responsive attention, and that's sensitive to the child's needs, and of course. They try to a some something that is a an authoritative parent makes demands and enforces them, whereas authoritative clearly here is, is certainly a lot better than authoritarian as we'll see in a minute, but uh, permits the child to make decisions that accord with readiness. That in other words gives the child the ability to make decisions that he or she is ready to make. That's an authoritative parent. You know, harsh or firm, but but you know, and in control but also giving the child a certain level of autonomy to the extent necessary. Authoritarian is when authoritative goes too far. Authoritarian is when the, the parent just, you know, I'm the boss and you do everything I say regardless. Uh, cold and rejecting degrades the child, you know, how dare you not listen to me, etc., etc. Uh, using force, using punishment, using these methods to, to force the child to listen and makes decisions for the child rather than li allowing the child to become part of the process. You know, authoritative is a good way of being in control, whereas authoritarian is taking control too far. The other way, the other uh, possibility, uh, is permissive, which is kind of the opposite of authoritative, could also be good in some ways. You know, warm to the child, but not really Attent not as attentive by not make not really making demands of the child and permits the child to make decisions before they're ready, which obviously is a problem. And then you have the extreme of permissive, which is uninvolved, which essentially lets the child do anything he or she wants, which is not a good parenting style either. Now we're at that next stage in development, and that is middle childhood. The child's already finished developing really the basic, basic skills, and now is continuing that process of becoming ready to be an adult. Motor development is a very important component of a child's development in general. These are gains in motor skills, especially in evident in terms of writing or drawing. Motor means anything essentially using motion or muscle. By age six, children can usually can print the entire alphabet, write numbers, print their first and last names. Their writing is usually larger at this point. They're making strokes with their whole arm rather than just the fine strokes that adults make with their wrists and fingers. And very often they can copy, uh, they can copy shapes, copy circles, squares, things like that. And they can draw things a little, draw basic diagrams. That's the stage at which you're talking about the motor development ought to be when a child reaches, let's say, age six or so. In addition to motor development, you also have memory, which is an aspect, certainly, of human development. Memory strategies, of course, children use various strategies to try to remember things, and they can be coached and helped to train themselves to better remember better remember things. A memory strategy is a deliberate mental activity we use to restore and retain information. As we're able to increase our attention span, 
as we're able to, rather than you know, two-year-olds or three-year-olds, which couldn't pay attention to the same thing for about 20 seconds, and then they're off to something else. Uh, as children get older, children are able to focus thing, on things a little bit more, and therefore their memory strategies improve. Because as we'll see, uh, memory strategies depend on attention. These memory strategies cannot be uh, carried into effect in, in three seconds. They need, they need a few minutes, or, or many minutes, or even hours sometimes. Memory strategies include rehearsal. Rehearsal means reporting, repeating the information constantly. If I want to know the names of when I think probably when I was seven or eight years old, I think I memorized all the state capitals or certain geography things. And the way you do it is one of the ways to do it is to repeat. Uh, you know, the capital of uh, New Hampshire is Concord. The capital of uh, Washington is Olympia. The capital of uh, Kansas is uh, Topeka. Whatever. Anyway. <laughs> I'm not here to, to show off, but the point is that uh, you know you repeat it to yourself a few times, and then once you repeat it to yourself for a few times, you can remember it, even if you memorized it when you were eight years old, and now you're well, whatever. Anyway, this strategy first appears in grade school. You know, people are ch children are sometimes ch trained to repeat or chant things in rote in order to remember them. Then there's organization, grouping things that are related items together. In this case. Mark, our young geography uh, whiz, groups the countries in Europe by region in order to help himself remember the countries. He might remember that the you know the low countries up in Northwest Europe are Belgium, uh, Netherlands, and Luxembourg. In, even though they may have, that's that's a good just a good way to remember the three of them because you remember the three of them as a group rather than just trying to remember the words independently. And then you have elaboration, which is even more advanced memory strategy. This creates a relationship or meaning between two pieces of information. This strategy becomes <coughs> more common as the as the child gets closer to adult. In other words, you try to associate something with some with with an event, or associate something with a person, or associate something with another, uh, you know, with another item. These are these are ways to remember also uh, to remember things. Picking up languages <coughs> is something that children are actually better than adults at doing. If I wanted to all of a sudden learn uh, French or whatever it is, it would be much harder now than if, if my six-year-old wants to learn French. Now my six-year-old might not have time either, and I, I, don't, I might not have time to teach my six-year-old French, but uh, many children do learn two languages, and when they're children is the, is the, best, way to, is the best time to do it. Approximately 20% of all U.S. children speak a language, language other than English at home, and two ways children can become bilingual, either they can acquire both languages at the same time, you know, both are spoken, especially let's say if, uh, if you have an expatriate family, an American family that moves to Israel or something, and they, and they hear both Hebrew and English constantly, they hear English from their parents, they hear Hebrew from their classmates and their friends, and they hear, on the phone from, they hear English on the phone from their grandparents, whatever it is, they may just pick up both at the same time. You know, they may have a little a little trouble distinguishing it. They may not fully understand at first which one is a Hebrew word, which one is an English word, but they end up knowing both. It's almost like two. It's almost like different words of the same of the same basic language. Uh, you know, the, the word glida means ice cream, and the word ice cream means ice cream. They just might see an ice cream and associate it with both in their mind. It may just be two different words that that, that as far as they're concerned, mean the same thing. Also, uh, they can become bilingual by learning a second language after mastering the first. That's a little bit harder, but it still, of course, can be done. This is a sensitive period. This early child or middle childhood, or early childhood as well, is a sensitive period for, sen uh, for second language develop developing uh, development, because if you develop the language skills at that point, they can be much more effective. Mastery must begin sometime in childhood for most second language learners to attain full proficiency. It's interesting that once you become an adult and you don't know a language, to learn that language, I mean, you can learn it. There's no, no question that an adult can learn a language, but mastery, and really speaking it well, is going to be extremely difficult if it wasn't picked up as a child. When school-age children acquire a second language, after they already speak a first language, they generally take five to seven years to attaining uh, to attain speaking and writing skills on par with their native, uh, with their native language, adults may never be able to <coughs> get the skills to speak that second language to the same extent or on the same level as that first one. Other things that involve these children in the you know late late children, the children who are who are a little bit older, older children, they learn to regulate themselves emotionally. 
they can cope based on the problem. If a child appraises the situation as changeable and decides what to do with it and engages in problem solving. Problem solving if a child is, you know, is sad for whatever reason because a friend is not speaking to him or whatever, or they got into a fight with a parent or got into a fight with a sibling. Well, these are the the parent, the child uh, who is now eight, nine, ten, eleven years old, may be able to try to figure out how to go ahead and solve the problem. Figure out what can be done. Can I make up? Can I, uh, you know, can I can I speak to my friends? Whatever it is. But then, if that doesn't work. The child may then turn to emotion-centered coping, which is internal and private and aimed in controlling the distress. So, for example, in this case, you may not be able to solve the problem externally, but you are able to figure out a way to cope with the problem. You know, when I when I feel bad about uh, being my friend being angry at me, maybe I think of other things. Maybe I, uh, you know, do other things to replace the value of that friend or something to that effect. Then you have peer acceptance, which is something that you know pretty much all children strive for. You know, striving for uh, the likability and the stage of being appreciated by friends. And the, this of peer acceptance means the extent to which a child is viewed by pairs or age mates, like classmates. And these are, of, co of course, every child strives for that. And children who are rejected can have very uh, negative emotional ramifications of that. Uh, the ch children who are rejected by their pairs very often act out and behave poorly. And that just reinforces it. You know, once they get to the point where they're behaving badly, then the other children look at them, look at them negatively. And that reinforces the problem. Obviously, breaking that cycle is very important. Uh, rejected aggressive children very often show high rates of conflicts, physical and relation, relational aggression, hyperactivity, inattention, impulse behavior. Again, like I said before, it feeds on itself because parent, children who see themselves as rejected feel like they need to get attention by, by acting out, and that just causes their peers to look at them in even, even, at an even worse light. Then you have the rejected children who withdraw. They're passive and socially awkward, timid, shy, likely to be overwhelmed by social anxiety. They're worried about being scorned and attacked by other people. They may have few or even no friends. They're at risk for harassment. You know, they're easy, easy targets. Easy targets for bullying and harassment by other children because they don't have friends and they haven't really developed the appropriate coping mechanisms. So unfortunately, bully children kind of see that and they sense that. They sense this is an easy target, and uh, and they may harass or bully these the children who have been rejected by their peers and uh, and have gone into withdrawal because of that. This can happen as early as kindergarten. And because of that, the child may not participate in the classroom, may have low academic achievement. Children might be smart. The child might be smart, but might not achieve academically just because they don't feel part of the group, so to speak. Uh, family influences could also, of course, have negative, uh, experience, negative influences on children. Divorce you know, or family conflicts uh, can, of course, try have serious impacts on children. Parents try to settle disputes over children and possessions. That could lead the child to uh, have high stress levels, depression, anxiety. And another big problem is that young children uh, often blame themselves for their parents breaking up. They think that, oh, well, the reason why my parents are breaking up is because I didn't behave, or something to that effect. Older children uh, may have the cognitive maturity to understand that they're not responsible for their parents' divorce, but even that, the you know, the temptation is so great, or the the impulse is so great to blame themselves that even older children sometimes blame themselves for their for their family's problems. So obviously, in that sort of a situation, in the broken home situation, it's very important to encourage the child and make sure that the child doesn't blame him or herself for any family problems. Our next chapter takes the development process one step further and now we get into adolescence and early adulthood. Adolescence being the end of childhood, you know, roughly age 13 to maybe 16, 17, that area. And then of course we're going to get to adulthood. Adolescence 
inform operational thought. They have the ability to make much more complex plans, including the use of hypotheticals, which is hypothetical deductive reasoning. When faced with a problem, the adolescent, the adolescent, or, no, I'm sorry, I said hypotheticals, I meant hypotheses. Well, close enough. Adolescent starts with a hypothesis that might affect the outcome. If the adolescent wants to buy a car and needs, you know, five thousand dollars, so they think, okay, you know, how can I get that five thousand dollars? One hypothesis is, I guess, I can ask my parents. Another hypothesis is I can get a job, I can sell things, whatever it is. From the hypothesis, he or she is able to deduce logical, testable inferences, kind of like experimentation. You know, we don't think of ourselves as using the scientific method, but we use the scientific method all the time. We form a hypothesis, we have a guess as to what might work to, to help in a particular situation, and then we figure out how to go about testing that hypothesis. We go about trying to test different possible solutions and determine their effectiveness. Then the adolescent systematically isolates and combines variables to see which of these are confirmed in the real world. Sounds very complicated. It's something that we all do. We may not think of it that way. Isolating and combining variables means to see which one is the thing that actually helped and which is the thing that didn't help. Uh, the adolescent is, uh, you know, gets very tired and then starts to eat and drink certain things and finds that when the adolescent had a, you know, had a good breakfast, then the adolescent was less tired. And then he thinks, well, okay, you know, that probably, but then, then he starts to think, well, you know, was it the coffee that did it or was it the cereal that did it or was it the toast that did it or was it the maple syrup that did it on the pancakes? And, uh, and th then maybe he starts saying, okay, well, tomorrow I'm just going to have uh, the coffee and no pancakes and see if that works. And if that doesn't work, he'll think, well, maybe the pancakes had something to do with it. And if it does work, then he'll think, well, obviously it was the coffee. These are things that, uh, you know, we don't think about it as being done using the hypothetical deductive reasoning method, but that's really what it is. Even school-age children show the glimmerings of the hypothetical deductive reasoning. Even children as young as six and seven can understand that th that different causes can have different impacts on different effects. Although school-age children usually can't deal with more than three than three or more variables, which means that the child may be able to connect eating breakfast with having energy, but the child probably can't connect the combined effects of having a good breakfast, having a good night's sleep, uh, having eaten enough protein the night the night before for supper, and not having stress, all combining to make the child feel good. A child of six or seven may not be able to figure that out, whereas an older child, a teenager, you know, might be able to, or certainly an adult, to engage in that sort of reasoning. Teenagers and adolescents, one of the big uh, things that they have to go through is establishing their own identity children kind of follow in the mold of their parents and follow in the mold of their peers. When a person gets, a te gets to be a teenager, the teenager will have to establish his or her own niche in the world. This includes a commitment to values, beliefs, and goals following a period of exploration. You know, get people may, children or adolescents, teenagers, may follow all their parents' examples in terms of their goals in life and their philosophies and the way they look at the world but they may not or they may examine it you know they may have a period of examination sometimes they you know where teenagers go off and they have their quote unquote rebellion which is basically they're trying to think on their own they're trying to you know get out of their parents shadow a little bit uh, then they may go through a period of moratorium. Moratorium means you stop doing something. So identity moratorium means where a parent basically puts their identity exploration on hold. They probably don't do it consciously. Their child, you know, 16 year old probably doesn't sit down and say, okay, well, you know, I'm gonna go for the next four months without uh, exploring my identity anymore. But a, parent, uh, but a child or a teenager may, may reach kind of a stage where they just don't uh, focus so much on identity and just uh, focus on other things. And then at some point, a child or a teenager may reach this identity foreclosure. Identity foreclosure uh, is the idea of not exploring, you know, reaching an identity or reaching a belief system without question or without exploration. These are not mutually exclusive. These may not happen to everybody. Some people may never do an identity foreclosure or an identity moratorium or achieve an identity even, but, uh, but this, these are different possibilities during the exploration of 
uh, of, a, of a, a teenager's surroundings. Then there's identity diffusion, which is an apathetic state characterized by lack of exploration and commitment, where a child just kind of gives up and says, you know what, I don't care that much. I'm a, obviously, this is not usually the stage reached by a perfectly healthy teenager, but identity diffusion may be where in a teenager kind of gives up on forming an identity. Of course, a teenager also undergoes biological aging, going from the form of a child at age 12 or so to the form of an adult at age 16 or 17. Once the body structures m reach maximum capacity and efficiency, biological aging begins. Aging is the decline of the organs in the organ systems. You know, once uh, a child reaches age 15 or 16, a child may be maximum in, at maximum capacity in terms of uh, in terms of development, in terms of height, in terms of everything. Now, some people grow grow longer. Some people will grow until they reach age 18 or 19 or 20 even. But uh, but at that point, once a, once a person reaches ages 15 or 16, they're pretty much developed when it comes to physical, and then the aging process starts. Genetically programmed aging receives some sort of longevity as a family trait. Uh, basically, the idea is that there are people that that have better or worse uh, genetic factors. People who come from a family of everybody that lives lives into their 90s, they're genetically predisposed to living to their 90s. That doesn't mean that they're definitely going to live into their 90s. There are, but there are risk factors that they may have better genes for, or you know, or worse genes for. A child, or in this case already an adult, as we're talking about the later part of adolescence, establishes a world view or a belief system. Most emerging adults say that by constructing a world view, that constructing a world view is essential for attaining adult status. That does, doesn't mean that that can't be changed, but I mean, I, in my personal experience, I can tell you that people's attitudes change a lot when they reach, you know, when they're when they're a child, when they're a teenager. Once they reach a certain age, most people are kind of settled. I mean, they change very, they change a little bit in terms of their worldview and outlook, but much more slowly and much less dramatically. People, once they reach the age of 20, 21, 22, something like that, very often they're kind of set in their ways. Of course, you could change, you could improve, but people probably change more in terms of their attitudes between the ages of 14 and 20 than between the ages of 20 and 80. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Uh, so about one-fourth of, you, of young adults, 18, 29-year-olds, are unaffiliated with a particular set of principles based on the idea that they may May not have established a particular belief system. Marital roles are important in the development of the adult and also, of course, in development of, of a child, including a teenager. Traditional marriages include a clear division of roles. You know, the traditional role was the husband was the head of the household, responsible to be the breadwinner, the wife was the caregiver and the homemaker. Today we have, you know, very often marriages that are a little bit more quote unquote egalitarian, which essentially means that there's more of a splitting of the roles. Partners are treated as equals, power and authority are shared, and both try to balance time and energy to devote to the various the various roles. You know, it's obviously much, much more common than it used to be for for wives to work and to be either the primary breadwinner for the family, or the, or at least you know, equal in terms of in terms of how much money they bring in, and so the traditional marriage kind of, there's it's not necessarily that one is better than the other, but uh, things are a lot different than they used to be in terms of gender roles in a marriage. Sometimes there's role overload, you know, which is not necessarily a good thing. This is where there's conflict between the demands of work and family, where one person, let's say for example, the mother is expected to go out and work from nine to five and then come home and be the, you know, and be the full caretaker, 100% for the family, uh, you know, in an egalitarian marriage. And then what would happen is, is they would both the husband and wife would work, but then both the husband and wife would kind of split the other responsibilities as well. If you have one spouse who's expected to do both, one spouse who's expected to work, and that spouse is expected to be the primary caretaker, that that could cause problems. It could link. It's linked to psychological stress, physical health problems, poor marital relations between the parents, less effective parenting, behavior child uh, behavior problems for the children, poor job performance. 
this is especially true for single women or for women who have uh, you know low work status roles where they don't make enough to uh, you know to to be home or to hire us you know hire uh, people to help or whatever it is who may not have that much autonomy you know maybe subject to a schedule of a boss and, and therefore may not be able to uh, to do things as efficiently so I mean just to illustrate this point or to expound on this point a little bit more women than men report moderate to high levels of stress when trying to meet both work and family responsibilities because even in, in the United States actually the majority of women with children are in the workforce which means that they're trying to hold down two, uh, two positions a position as uh, as caretaker and a position as breadwinner not that that's impossible certainly if there's proper allocation of duties among the spouses especially if there's uh, if there's other family members giving support other extended family members giving support that obviously can help a lot couples in prestigious careers have more control over both work and family domains you know they may make enough money to hire somebody to help with the help with the chores and most most dual earner incomes in other words people with that where both spouses work and make money uh, with their role overload, they co they cope with it by scaling back at home, or restructuring their family roles. You know, bringing in other people to help, bringing in extended family members to help, and of course, workplace support is also available to reduce work work overload. For example, uh, a business might give free daycare or something like that, and free daycare for the children may reduce overload for the mother who's working there, and also decrease stress on behalf of the mother and therefore allow her to be more productive. And also, of course, offering time flexible policies, time off to care for a sick child, etc. can help as well in the same way. Now we get to the point where the development is finished and now we're into the aging process. Now we've had the young adult, the young adult's already had a family, the young adult has already uh, uh, established a worldview, and now all of a sudden you get to middle adulthood, you know, where I am. <laughs> you get to the point where you're not that young, as, you're, not, you're not as young as you used to be. And the, the middle adult has already established a worldview, and the middle adult has already done, done okay in terms of hopefully uh, having a family, whatever the case may be, having a career. And now it's time to start looking at... Uh, well, the other end, so to speak. Okay, then first issue, and this is really more of an issue for women than it is for men, but still can be an issue for men also, is the idea of osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is an age-related is age-related bone loss, which affects women again a little bit more than men. But osteoporosis uh, can be a severe disease, and what people can do to fight that actually is to eat plenty of calcium and, and to get tested. And again, I'm not a doctor, but uh, you can ask your doctor. Uh, these are bones kind of get eaten away. They're porous. They have low density level. The reason why calcium helps is because calcium is a mineral that is in bones and it allows the bones to replenish themselves uh, if assuming you have enough calcium. Now adult learning, you know children aren't the only people that learn. Adults obviously can learn uh, you know can learn as well and many adults go back to college or go back to study things in the middle and you know in middle lives in middle middle of their lives so to speak. Uh, students aged now, the, age 25 is obviously not middle-aged, a middle-aged person. It's still, it's still a very young person. But traditionally, the college student was between age, you know, 17 and 21, 17, 18, and 22, something like that. Uh, graduate students were in their 20s. Now, very often, students in their 30s, 40s, 50s, or even older, uh, are going back to school. Up to 39 percent of people are considered not the traditional young student so to speak now returning students students who come to come to school a little bit later on in life first of all they may have demands outside school uh, that pull them in conflicting directions you know women who come back to school might have jobs they might have families men also might have jobs and families uh, but uh, these are it's it's a it's harder I mean I deal with a lot of adult students of course and adult students have you know on the one hand they're more serious very often than children you know they're coming to school because they because they're convinced that it's that it's important rather than because their parents told them to but uh, but they but they may not be able to they may have other things that that affect their lives and put them in a situation where they're not able to do things uh, as quickly or as efficiently as children who have nothing else to do or 20 you know 20 year olds who have nothing else to do would be able to 
adult learners list role overload as the most common reason for not completing their degree. They've got families, they've got issues, and they just simply can't can't handle it for whatever reason. Uh, many returning learners are afraid that they won't be able to handle the classwork also. You know, a 21-year-old going to college, is, is, or an 18-year-old going to college has been in school for the last uh, 15 years, and they're used to going to school. A uh, 50-year-old coming back to school for the you know for the first time in 25 years or the first time in 30 years might be a little nervous and might not might say I you know I'm not I don't have the same kind of brain that I did when I was 22 I'm not sure if I can handle it. You know, people think of uh, adults uh, getting smarter as they get older, but actually that may be true in terms of experience. But in terms of raw brain power, you know IQ, you're probably at your prime in your 20s, or early 20s even. By the time you get to 35, 40, 50 years old, uh, you may have more experience, and therefore you may have more patience. You may have more ability to study properly, and in that case, you might have, an, in that sense, you might have an advantage. But in terms of raw brain power, you probably you know slow down a little bit uh, by the time you reach even your 30s. Some adults experience what is sometimes called a midlife crisis. Uh, midlife crises is where feelings of self-doubt and stress, especially during the 40s, prompt major restructuring of the personality. People start thinking, "Oh man, I'm not I'm not that young anymore. I'm getting old. What am I? What do I do?" And uh, people regret that that the opportunities they didn't take when they were younger. So you have Kyle, for example, over here, who wanted to be a dentist and capitulated and became a lawyer <laughs> instead. And now, when he's 45 years old, all of a sudden he's sitting there in his law firm and he wishes he were drilling somebody's cavities. And he, that could be a mid midlife crisis. Or, and midlife crisis, of course, sometimes causes people to do things dramatic to kind of reshuffle themselves, reshuffle their lives, uh, either to make themselves feel younger by buying sports cars, you know, that's the classic, uh, you know, prototypical, stereotypical midlife crisis, but also some, some people deal with midlife crises by going back to school, you know, Kyle over here might go to dental school <laughs> when he's 45 years old because he wants to start a new career as a dentist. That, not, that may not be a bad thing necessarily, but uh, so the outcomes of a midlife crisis don't necessarily have to uh, be bad necessarily. Grandparenthood. Middle-aged adults typically rate grandparenthood all of a sudden as highly important. They, they're, all of a sudden they get to deal with their children's children, of course. Grandparenthood could help the mindset of adults and make them feel good for many reasons. First of all, they uh, they are perceived as uh, you know somebody who's wise and helpful, somebody who can kind of be a patriarch or a matriarch of a family. Immortality through descendants. Once one reason why people have children is because they want to perpetuate their own legacy, rather than having their their legacy die with them, and. But the idea of having grandparents, you know, grandchildren kind of presses home this idea that your legacy is being perpetuated deep into the future. Reinvolvement with personal past. You can pass family history values to a new generation. Now all of a sudden there's a new set of children. Whereas, you know, you spent you might have spent fifteen years teaching your own children about your family and about yourself and about your values and about your belief system. Now all of a sudden it's there's there's a new set of children to continue to pass on. Now obviously the parents are going to have the primary responsibility for that, but certainly grandparents can help. And of course finally indulgence, having fun with children without major uh, child rearing responsibilities. I remember once seeing a coffee commercial where, you know, a woman, a, a grandmother was sitting there drinking her coffee, saying to the camera, uh, I had the most wonderful day with my grandchildren. They came over, and we played, and we talked, and I read them stories. And she speaks like this for like 26, 27 seconds, and then looks at the camera and says, and then they went home. <laughs> I guess that was also a good part of it. The idea of, of, uh, of being a grandparent is that you can, uh, you know, you can have children, you can play with your children, kind of, but you don't have to worry about them, you know. Then at the end of the day, they're somebody else's responsibility. They're, uh, I guess you can worry about them a little bit, but uh, I guess they're, it's certainly the idea that you're not solely responsible for them can be another good part of grandparenthood. Then you have the issue, obviously, something that middle-aged people have to deal with, and that is their elderly parents. 
uh, you know, many adult uh, adult children become more appreciative of their parents' strength and generosity because they see what it's like being an adult. Not so easy being being a parent, and then all of a sudden you start to appreciate your parents more. Uh, many adult children notice positive changes in the quality of their relationships even as their parents are getting older. Uh, they're getting a little calmer, their parents are getting a little calmer, they're getting a little older, and so obviously the ideal scenario is for middle-aged uh, children to develop good relationships with their aging parents. Uh, middle-aged daughters forge closer, more supportive relationships with elder parents than sons do. Maybe they're a little more sympathetic to it, but that can be certainly an element of middle-aged growth as well. Now unfortunately we're at the end of the course and well you know what that means when it comes to development. That means the end of life and late life issues that are relevant to development or the lack thereof. First of all there's this idea of language processing. Language processing is something that we learn how to do early of course and as we get older as people get uh, the brain functioning starts to decrease people get into their 70s 80s and 90s it starts to become harder. Lang in language comprehension we recollect what we have heard without conscious awareness. We hear a word, we hear an idea and we know what it means because we've heard it so many times before. Certainly those who have invested more time in reading and literacy activities over their lifetimes display faster and more accurate reading comprehension. That actually can help with uh, with with s slowing the effects of aging. You know, in a different course, I think it was Abnormal Psych or one of the other uh, courses, I remember this idea that uh, if people who have have a good education and have read a lot, their Alzheimer's takes takes root a little bit more slowly in them, because of the, I guess it's because of this concept, because of the fact that even if you you're by reading more and by studying more and by being more familiar with concepts and words, it's more automatic. You don't have to your brain doesn't have to work as hard to 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 have recollections because you're so used to it. And so even during the aging process, the more you've read and the more you've learned, the easier it will be to recall information, <coughs> even when your brain is not able to do so as efficiently as it once did. So, and two aspects of language production show these age-related losses as people get older. Number one, difficulty retrieving words from long-term memory, where people can't find the appropriate word that they're thinking of. or you're thinking of something and you just can't express it properly. That's a symptom of aging and that can happen again because of the idea that the brain just isn't as sharp at working things out. And then there's difficulty planning what we say and how we say it. You know, I'm sitting here now, I'm a relatively young person, not that young, but <laughs> a relatively young person as far as this chapter is concerned. Uh, so, and when hopefully when I'm thinking of ideas, they come out pretty naturally. You know, I don't have to sit here and think, I don't have to sit here and pause the recording every time I want to figure out a sentence, although I do it sometimes when I'm, when it's a complicated sentence or a complicated phrase. Uh, uh, interestingly, I just did pause it because the fact that it's it's the, the suggestive idea, and this has nothing to do with this with this chapter. But in general, when something is suggested, that causes your mind to uh, to think about it. Sometimes, if you suggest that you're going to get a headache, if you say, "I have a headache, I have a headache, I have a headache," you can actually give yourself a headache. <laughs> I've done it. Believe me. Don't don't do it. Don't try. Just take my word for it. You can actually give yourself a headache just by sitting there and closing your eyes and thinking about the fact that you want to that you're going to give yourself a headache. It'll actually happen. So uh, the same thing is true here when you're you, so it's not what I said well what I said was that I, I suggested that I was going to lose my train of thought and so therefore I actually did start to lose my train of thought so I had to pause it but in general aging a symptom of aging is a difficulty in planning in terms of how we say it oh, repeating words starting a sentence and stopping sentence fragments without completing the entire thought hesitations etc hope I don't give myself a headache now <laughs> okay the next aspect of what I want to cover in this chapter is managing aging. The idea of making sure that the aging process, you know, it happens to all of us. It's a lot better to age than not to age, as they say. But how aging can best be supported. Well, there are different possibilities, and a lot of these are very similar to the process of raising children and uh, how that can be best operated. Sup social support. Social support from other people reduces stress, promotes physical health, psychological well-being, and availability of social support of other people. That could be children, that could be friends, that could be siblings, that could be other relatives. Actually increases the odds of, of living longer. 
although when the person perceives that other people are helping him but he's not able to help other people that can actually cause some psychological stress still there's also could be formal support where the family can't give the maximum amount of support you may have a paid home helper helper or an agency and of course this can add on and relieve the kind of the stress of the family formal support not only uh, helps it can help to relieve the caregiving burden and it spares the aging person from feeling guilty about uh, making the family care for him. You know, somebody is very old, somebody's 85 years old, not only can, you know, being in a place where you have hired support you know, in, a, in a group or whatever it is, so it can help, but it can also make the person feel less guilty about taking the time of the children and grandchildren who are also there to give support. It doesn't mean that you have to have one or the other, you can obviously have both, but it, a formal support structure can help uh, not only with giving the additional support, but also making the person feel less guilty about taking the support of the family. For social support to foster well-being, the adult, uh, adults should try to take, the older adults should try to take control of it as much as possible. This is an example over here of a case where an adult may not have the energy to do everything, so the adult lets somebody else to handle some things in order to do, in order to focus on other things. So in this case, Ruth, for example, can handle dressing, shopping, and food preparation, but she allows her daughter to assist with these activities to give her the energy to handle things that she does enjoy, like reading and gardening. Uh, you know, I, I've had experience that also with you know with elderly people that you know may finally let their children now take care of their finances and have access to their banking account, their bank accounts, and their checkings, checking accounts in order you know to write the checks and everything. So because at that age, you know, 80, 85 years old, doing that sort of thing may be possible for the adult, but it may take an enormous amount of concentration. Where the adult would, it's probably better to focus on things that give the adult more satisfaction, give the person more satisfaction and more, uh, more pleasure while letting the mundane things be taken care of by other people. Perceived social support also helps, obviously. An amount of family help may not itself be the determining factor. What is the determining factor is, does the elderly person perceive that there's a strong network? Do, your, do my children care for me? Do my grandchildren care for me? nieces and nephews, whatever it is. The amount of help might not really matter that much as much as the psychological benefit it provides to the elderly person knowing that he or she has a strong support structure. Older adults, of course, benefit, just like anybody, from affection, affirmation of their self-worth, a sense of belonging. That's why you know, going to a, to a group home, an elderly group home, even though many people, when they're younger, pretty much everybody I know always says, when I get older, I don't want, I, you know, I want to live with my family. I don't want to go to a group home. That sounds terrible, living with a bunch of old people. But on the other hand, once you get to that age, once you get to be 75, 80 years old, uh, you know, if you're with your family, you may not be able to contribute to their day-to-day -day activities. They're out there, they're doing things, they're doing young person things. Whereas if you're in a group home with other people that are your age, uh, you can you can be on more of an equal social level with them. It may, may be a little bit easier. Extroverted seniors, people who are like to hang out with other people, are more likely to take advantage of these opportunities, reducing loneliness and fostering self-esteem and satisfaction. And of course, social ties aren't based strictly on quantity of contact. If, you're, if the elderly person's child comes to visit for four hours a day, but they sit around doing nothing, or they don't talk about important things, or they don't really have meaningful connections, that might not matter. High quality relationships, expressions of kindness, encouragement, respect, are of course uh, very important. And then, of course, for our last topic, we move to, you know, the obviously sad topic that happens at the last stage of all human development, and that is, of course, death. And death comes with bereavement. Bereavement means the experience of losing a loved one by death. And grief, which is the reaction to a death, reaction to, bere to bereavement, is intense physical and psychological distress. And people, in general, it's normal when somebody experiences a death in the family to experience grief and the idea of grief of course is to is to mourn 
and mourning helps relieve grief. Mourning is the culturally specified expressions of the bereaved person of the of the person's thoughts and feelings. Sitting around talking to people, you know, sitting shiva, something like that, obviously. Or these are things where where people gather around and people discuss uh, discuss what they, you know, what what the the person's life, and you kind of it's kind of an outlet to relieve grief by by uh, getting all the experiences and feelings and thoughts on the table, and uh, and not keeping them bottled up and eating away at the person. And that's pretty much all we had for for this course. So thank you for listening. I want to wish you good luck on the exam, and we'll see you in a different course. Thank you.